Oh, I don't care. You should. You get paid a lot of money you have on Fridays. Uh, you know, do we have labs every other week? There's no lab at Ecos Chase out of town. It's going to be next week. But, you know, it's going to be a, it isn't required that we can work on it. But we'll see. Uh, so today, we're actually going to, we're going to chapter 8. Um, see, there's one chapter that we don't. Is it microphone? Oh, God, I think I didn't. Sorry. It's okay. I used to. Okay. They're okay. <coughs> Test. Okay. Sorry. Okay. So today we're going to begin chapter eight, and um, we're s there's. So it looks like we've skipped two chapters. Okay, one of them we are actually going to skip because that's really a topic in 3452. It's like radiation patterns. I don't know what it is. I can't even remember. There's no need for us to do that, which is in the book, that chapter that's in the book. The magnetostrictive material, or whatever it's called, it's appropriate to do that later. Uh, we're not going to have a quiz on that. It's short. It's a, one lecture is all that's needed. So that's going to be done the last week that we meet, along with chapter 10. Oh, ch I guess chapter 9 is the one that is really done in 3452. Yeah. And then chapter 10 we'll do. That's just a, it's a real short. No quiz on that either. So that's why we're doing these out of order. All right. So um, um, when people use the word hydrophone, they're, what they mean is uh, an electroacoustic transducer that detects sound in water or any other liquid. Um, so essentially it's an underwater microphone. Uh, most hydrophones detect acoustic pressure, uh, but uh, they could detect some other acoustic quantity. Uh, particle velocity, pressure gradient, these two are closely allied. You can. Uh, once you know one, you can get the other one. Um, particle displacement or even particle acceleration. I'm not really, I don't know of any that detect these latter two, but they're probably out there. Um, and you all know, and we've talked about this before, there's a big need right now in, in, for uh, particle velocity hydrophones, so-called vector sensors. Oh, I guess that's why it's nice to use the word um, I wrote particle velocity here because that's the natural way to detect, to have directionality. If you know what the particle, the direction of the particle velocity is, typically within 180 degrees. You usually don't know it uniquely, okay? But you, there's a ways to getting that. Um, we actually talked about that last quarter. Um, but it doesn't have to be uh, particle velocity, okay? You know, it's, it's basic. What it's basically picking up on could be um, acceleration, for example. That's going to give you the direction. Um, these are more difficult. These, these so-called vector sensors are, are, are more difficult than the standard pressure hydrophones. And incidentally, there's a need for this directional microphones, too, in air. It's the same thing. Uh, for example, the Army is very interested in that. You can imagine some soldier with a helmet equipped with transducers. It's also going to take a computer to uh, instantly be informed where a gunshot comes from, right? Uh, of course, the big problem with that is echoes, reflections. So that's why it needs extensive um, signal processing. But ultimately, it should be able, you would think, be able to get inf instant information on that. That would obviously be useful, right? Okay, so anyway, most hydrophones are pressure sensitive. That's what we're going to, um, and they use a piezo ceramic. So that's what we're going to focus on in this, in this chapter. Uh, now, there are more, just as in air, there are more, um, a lot more hydrophones than projectors. 
And like I said, yeah, I think I'm pretty sure the same. Well, I don't know. God, the audio industry is, you know, it's crazy, right? It's, it's such a big business kind of thing. Um, there are, of course, a lot of loudspeakers out there. Well, maybe I'm not right about this, but, but they all are pretty much the same, <laughs> okay? They, they're hyped to be different, okay? And uh, people will jump on the latest little advance or something like that in order to, because it's a, such a commercial thing, right? But um, what's going on there, at least in the hydrophone case, and I, and I think in, in the audio case too, is the, um, the requirements are different for, for detection or projection. And typically detection is, is more complicated. Usually has to do with signal to noise ratio. That's really not an issue for projectors. For projectors, often you're interested in efficiency. And you don't really care about efficiency in, in, uh, in sensors. Um, right. So anyway, that's what we're, and we'll, you will, um, you'll see that here when we go through some of the interesting things that have been, that have been done here in the relationship with, uh, with hydrophones. <coughs> interesting geometries in particular. Now all piezoelectric transducers are reversible, so you say, you might say, well, who, who, who cares about this? Well, the problem is they really, they have different optimization factors. So even though you can um, typically use one both, and, and people do, you often for, um, for better resolution or for whatever, you know, better quality signal, you usually want to have separate hydrophones and projectors. And incidentally, this occurred to me just this morning, the <laughs> an, an analog here is oscilloscopes and signal analyzers. Nowadays, by signal analyzer, I mean FFT type analyzer, which are very common, as you all know, right? Um, they all can act as an oscilloscope. And nowadays, oscilloscopes almost always have FFT anal analysis available to you. But do you see people switching back? Well, people who don't have money, yeah, they'll switch back and forth. They'll use the same box to do both. But it's really convenient to have a separate, separate oscilloscope and separate signal analyzer. And there, it's not just for speed, it's not just, well, the convenience extends to the fact that oscilloscopes are set up so that you can readily and easily, you know, operate them as an oscilloscope. It's usually trouble to operate them as an FFT. And they don't have the flexibility that you need. I see this all the time. So I, we, in, in my lab, we always, we have both, you know, I think, I, I suspect this is pretty universal. What's your guys' experience? No one. No one really cares or knows. I use one for both, but that's just because it's there's no room left on the bench. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Convenience is a big deal when you're doing experiments, you know. Since, and you never know what's going to happen. Yeah. <clears throat> um, okay, so in hydrophone design and in your choice, if you're going to buy one for research or whatever. Um, there's a, lo a lot of factors here, and here, let's, so this is probably I probably got this from the book. Let's just we'll just briefly run through these. Uh, first of all, as we discussed, it's what acoustic variable is that? What's at the heart of being detected in there? You know, once you detect, we talked about this with accelerometers, right? Accelerometers at the heart, they detect acceleration. Remember that, and that's why they're called accelerometers. Uh, you can get a velocity readout. You know, it's typically simple harmonic motion. You can get a readout, but we still call them accelerometers because at the heart of what's being detected there, the physics of what's going on, it's picking up on acceleration, right? So there, um, of interest is what variable you pick up on. And again, there's this whole, there's this list here. Potentially, I've just listed all possibilities here. Uh, directionality, as we mentioned, that can be important, may or may not be important. Frequency range, obviously. Uh, and going along with frequency range is flatness. Usually you want the sensitivity to be independent of frequency. So if you've got a sound wave coming in so many pascal, 
you don't, um, in the frequency changes, you want to get the same voltage out, right? That's flatness. Uh, linearity. So you double the input amplitude, you get double the, double the voltage, as we've discussed before. That's usually important. Sometimes you have to sacrifice that. You know, remember hot wire, remember I talked about hot wire microphones? That must have been last quarter. Yeah, they are neither flat nor linear. So why do people use them? Well, the same reason people use anything, because they have to, okay? Somebody, you know, some application. We had one where we, I'm not gonna, I don't wanna get into the details because I could eat up all the time, but we, we um, had to use it. Well, in the end we did and we, we we had to abandon it. It wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't sufficiently. It, it. It didn't work, basically. But then we went to another type of uh, of transducer. We were able to get a different type. Uh, dynamic range. This is the useful range of input amplitudes. Uh, background noise. This should be really. I should add here. Signal to noise ratio. That's what. That's the bottom line there. Um, Sensitivity, calibration, the list just keeps going on and on. Cost and expendability, this is a, a kind of a big deal, I think, in, in uh, ocean, out there in the ocean, you know, what I would call field experiments, okay? I, I'm like a laboratory person, okay? But, um, you know, you can't always do that, especially in underwater acoustics, right? You gotta go out there in, in the field, which could be the ocean or a lake or something like that, and you may have to uh, sacrifice a transducer. You may just, you know, throw it overboard and use it for as long as you can or, or whatever. And, you know, you, know there's, you don't want to have to retrieve it. So this, the issue of cost and expendability becomes important. And actually, going along with that is how long will it last if, if you're going to throw it down there. You know, so there's all these, and reliability, there's a lot of issues here. And another one out in the field, in general, is, um, you know, what's this going to be subjected to? Right. There's a whole list of possibilities there. And of course, another big thing about not being in a laboratory is power. That becomes a big issue. In a, in a laboratory, we, we just never care about it. So, I mean, um, you know, we care about it when the need arises. Like, I, once I needed 220 volts or something like that. So we had to have that. But if you have 110, you can have 220. It's just how they hook it up. So we had to have somebody from Public Works come over. That was when Public Works actually did their job. They don't do their job anymore. So <laughs> Here, anyway. Okay. Uh, just a little bit, a little bit deeper on, I mean, you all know what sensitivity is. We've seen this since last quarter, since the last course. But a little, uh, a little bit more in depth here. Uh, and incidentally, these statements apply also to uh, microphones and air. Almost always what uh, hydrophones and microphones pick up is what's called the, the free field pressure. I don't know if you've heard of this before, but uh, people often nowadays, it's just assumed. It's usually, they don't even say it. And what it is is the microphone you want to find, you've got a situation, you've got a sound field, and you want to measure the pressure, let's say, somewhere, okay? So you say, okay, I'll put a microphone or a hydrophone here, but you would worry that the presence of the sensor, of the device here, could alter the field, and it does alter the field. There's no question about it. So how do you get around that? Well, this has been a, a problem that's been around for a long time, for many decades, and there, you can actually correct in the transducer, they correct for the presence of the, of the detector. Now, it's typically not a big deal when the wavelength is large compared to the detector. It can be much more important when the wavelength gets small. Then it becomes serious. But it's, uh, it can have an effect even if, if you want to be really accurate, even longer wavelengths. So they're corrected for that now. They measure what's called the free field pressure. Um, Remember, the sensitivity is, of course, the output voltage divided by, so it's going to be then the free field pressure, okay? But we usually drop this nowadays. Um, and we've been dealing with the open circuit sensitivity. 
So we have a microphone or a hydrophone. I'll just, I should just say hydrophone. And it's always, there's usually some kind of conditioning box. It supplies, often supplies power. Now for piezo ceramics, you don't have to power piezo ceramics. That's, a, that's a, an advantage of piezo ceramics, right? Typical condenser or capacitive microphones, which is the most common type of microphone, or at least ac for accurate uh, test, so-called test purposes, you gotta keep the charge on the capacitor and it'll bleed off. Um, but there's also a conditioning box to give some pre-amplification to the signal. You don't want to send a weak, typically the signal coming out of the bare transducer is, is weak. It's going to be subject to noise. So you don't want to send it along some cable where you can just pick up noise. So you want to do some kind of pre-amplification. So that's the job of the preconditioner, a, a box right, that goes with a transducer, at least in air, case of air. Um, so the, the signal coming there is, is detected, the voltage is detected. There's very little current, so that's why we call it open, open circuit. There are some unusual cases where you want to do the extreme opposite, and that's where you want to measure current instead of voltage. So what you do there is you short the output. That's the other po typical other case, although it's done very infrequently, okay? I mean, you, you, I guess you can imagine weird cases that are in, in some sense in between these two. But almost always it's open circuit, very extremely little current is drawn. It's essentially just looking at voltage. And the other case where you short it and you measure the current. Um, and as I've told, as many, already in this course I've mentioned to you several times or more that almost always the a hydrophone or an element of a hydrophone array is small compared to the wavelength. So they're going to be omnidirectional. They're measuring pressure and because the wavelength is large and they're measuring pressure, they can't tell you the direction. Right? So we call that omnidirectional or isotropic. Uh, if you do have a directional hydrophone, it's the sensitivity should be specified as a function of, of the orientation. And it's almost, it, it, the convention is, is that it'll give you the greatest, has the greatest sensitivity when it's aligned with the direction of the sound. Right, and the sensitivity will fall off as you go. And this is called the acoustic axis. Remember last quarter, we introduced that? It's called the acoustic axis. So we talked a little bit about, and um, we've talked about this before a lot, flatness, sensitivity is independent of frequency over some range. That's all, all very often desirable. Um, and it's achieved in piezo ceramics similarly to other transducers, because what, what you basically have there is a driven, the incoming sound is driving a simple harmonic oscillator. So if you think back to 3119, you get this classic resonance curve, steady state amplitude as a function of frequency. So the wave is at some frequency, it's driving some simple, your transducer, which is effectively a simple harmonic oscillator, a damp simple harmonic oscillator. And you know that um, in the so-called quasi-static limit, or in better, it's better to call it stiffness controlled regime, sufficiently below the resonant frequency, it's going to be flat. All right. Now I want to add something here that I got interested in just last night, um, and I, this is what is done for microphones in air. This is uh, and this, it's kind of a big deal. They put a lot of effort into this. What I'm what I'm about to say, I don't really know what they do with hydrophones. Okay, but if any of you know, speak up. Okay, they they may very well do this. You want of this, of course, to be as big as possible, right? So you run into the resonance here, and you get very different sensitivity. So the natural thing to, to do here is to put in damping, right? Beat this down. 
So for microphones in air, which is what I'm very familiar with, you'll, you buy a, a reasonably good microphone, or a, a, um, you know, test quality or whatever the word they use. Mm -hmm. Microphone, like laboratory use or musical use. You'll have a little, chart, a little graph in there. And they'll show you this curve, okay? And typically what it does is it rises a little bit here and then falls off. They, they beat it down to, uh, to extend the, the range of flatness there. And as I said, I don't know if they do a similar thing with hydrophones. It, pr it could be that for hydrophones, this is so far out there that you don't need to do it. Does anybody know anything about this? Okay. Um, anyway, it's kind of interesting. So you might think, oh, you should critically damp the oscillator. Now, do you guys all know about critical damping? I don't know if it's in, I don't think it's introduced in 3119, but you've all probably seen it. It's in the 2000 level mechanics course here. I don't know if the USW students take that. So critical damping is a big deal. It's, it's for, in general, damp simple harmonic motion. Uh, if you want the mass to return to equilibrium the quickest, you want to critically damp the oscillator. If it's under damped, it oscillates like this. If it over damps, it can just slowly take a long time here. So this is ex a very useful in a lot of practical situations. Usually it's when the equilibrium changes. I have some, some kind of oscillator and all of a sudden I'm going to move something over here and I want it to relax as quickly as possible to the new equilibrium position. Uh, the classic example is shocks on cars. Right? So you want those to be critically damp. So question, do they critically damp these microphones? I didn't know the answer to that, and I looked in Taylor, the standard mechanics book that's now used, and he didn't have it. So I had to go on the internet. And anyways, I found it in Wikipedia in about you know, 20 seconds. <laughs> well, I had to think about it. I had to, so I had to look at the quantities, so 30 seconds, <laughs> okay. And the answer is no. If you look at the, the resonance curve for critically damp, it goes something like this. It goes down like this. So they, um, it's, it's, it's still under damp, My air, microphones and air. If anybody finds out anything about this for sonar stuff, just let, let me know, okay? Because I, I don't know in this case, I don't know if it's, a, if it's an issue. It may not even be an issue. But it's kind of a, you know, they, they something they pay attention to in microphones and air. Um, now, let me remind you that, you know, the typical hydrophone, the wavelength in water is substantially bigger than the, than the size of the hydrophone. So this means that the wavelength in the actual transducing material, the ceramic, is going to be even bigger because the speed of sound is going to be bigger in the solid than water, right? So, um, because of that, you should be way below the first resonance of the material. You should be way below that. Um, now, in some cases, and I'm sure this has happened, you may want to you may want to just be interested in picking up one frequency. In that case, you may want to actually operate. You know, you may want to operate on resonance. There could be, there obviously could be an advantage there, a big, you know, much greater sensitivity. And especially if you have a high, Q, with a high Q. When people do that, let me just mention, I don't, I've never done this myself, but I've heard about it. Hoffler, the, oh, the guy who I mentioned, who, who, who's an expert and used to teach this course. Um, I mentioned him yesterday, right, I think. Uh, Instead, I forgot to tell you that so he was a really good, he's a, he's a really good experimentalist. And, but when you walk into his lab and you start talking to him, it, it, it becomes clear that he, um, he places a lot of importance on the transduction. I don't know, I remember the first day we met in this class, I told you that transducer people are different, that often they you'll find that they tend to care more about the transduction than what, it's being, than what the transducer is being used for. Yeah, so he, he was kind of, he was like, he was, he's like that. He was, um, 
you know, the, the discussions usually get away from what the, the transducer is being used for, and they go to, well, how, how does a transducer work? You know, but it's good. We need people like that, right? <clears throat> I can't live without them. Okay. Um, so uh, where was I here? Yeah. So. Um, yeah, so he was one who uh, has done something similar to this before. I remember talking to him about this. Um, it, you can operate on residence, um, and then what people often do is, um, it, it's different for diff of different situations, but there's often a feedback circuit in there to, um, to try to stay on resonance. Now, to be honest, in his case, it wasn't, receiving it was transmitting. He had a thermoacoustic refrigerator and he wanted to drive it on resonance to get the greatest possible refrigeration. It, I think I mentioned this before, it turns out you can, although not in any depth, you can use high amplitude sound to refrigerate. And this is not obvious how that works, but it's reasonable that it could be possible because sound involves compression, adiabatic compressions and expansion. It gets hot and cold in there. So it turns out you can turn that into a DC effect, the oscillations, and actually use it to refrigerate. This was extremely popular in the 90s. It started off in the 60s and then it got real popular. Now it's, it's not that much, it's not uh, very popular. People are still doing it. I, still, I just recently saw an article. Um, but it has some big advantages over the standard um, refrigeration. <coughs> For example, there's no um, uh, caustic chemicals that are used. In the, the refrigerant, it's just, it's just sound you're using. It has, there's one moving part, you have a driver. So what he did was he wanted to track resonance. So he built a, uh, a feedback circuit to make sure he was always driving on resonance. Because resonant frequency will shift. Right, and it will shift here if you want. It. So that could be a, you know, potential problem. Would people how they handle that as they handle it with a feedback circuit? With another sensor, you still need another sensor to use in the feedback circuit. <laughs> uh, okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to consider different piezo ceramic hydrophone configurations, geometries, and it turns out to be um, interesting. As you'll, as I, I, th I think it's interesting. I'm, I'll try to convince you of that too. And as we go on here in the next few lectures, you'll see um, some of this. Some of the research wasn't done until the 1970s, so it's not that old. They were still making progress on this. And um, you'll you'll see how that how that goes. Okay. So. Um, what we're going to do right now is we're going to um, look at uh, do the analysis, basically getting the sensitivity due to from the equivalent circuit of a hydrophone. And um, next lecture we'll look at using the uh, you know the piezo the the transducer relationships, the piezo elastic relationships with boundary conditions to determine the sensitivity from, the, from those equations. <coughs> now we can, uh, because the dimensions we're gonna, well, are assumed to be small compared to the wavelength, we don't have to worry about standing wave stuff, so we can just directly use our, all, the, all the stuff we've built on here. If, here's what I mean by this, I, I think. <laughs> when you go back and look at this, you'll, you'll see that there was, um, in our relationships, we deal with like stress and strain and displacement and electric field. It's nice when all of these are uniform, right? I think that's the key word here. Um, we can readily deal with those when they're uniform. When you have standing waves in there, it becomes a lot more, a lot more complicated. Yeah, we'll talk a little bit. So this is the uh, the sensitivity um, frequency response is basically going to be you know over what range is flat, and we'll talk a little bit about this um, later in this chapter. What's called this figure of merit. <coughs> okay, so the first case here is going to be something we've seen before. This is the thickness. It, back then, it was called a thickness vibrator. 
And you remember in that chapter, I think it was chapter five, whatever, yeah, I think it was chapter five, um, we dealt with this, and then we actually, even though that chapter was on projectors, Brian snuck in this section on uh, using it as a hydrophone, right? So, <coughs> here it is, it's uh, polled, it's polarized and polled, you know, electroplated in the same direction, which seems to always be the case, this we, which we, and we call it the Z direction. It's relatively thin, so this d dimension here, T and double, t, uh, t is small compared to W and L, right? And we're going to think of this as operating as a hydrophone. And <coughs> we want to expose just the electroded surfaces to the sound, not the sidewalls. So we're going to imagine that those are shielded. Now, I don't know if you remember this, but when we talked about this before, I became concerned about, you know, it, you might, we, these are thin here. These sidewalls are thin. So what does it matter? There's going to be very little force there, right? And I and I did. I told. I don't know if you remember this. I said I was going to. I can't remember what I said, but something like to the effect that I was going to reconsider this. Well, I did. And I don't think you can uh, neglect. It is true that the force is going to be small here, but what's important is really the stress, which is the pressure. And I think the idea here is that. So it, it will have an effect. I now think that um, this is correct, that we need to, that you can't neglect the effect. If, this, if these sidewalls here are exposed to sound, you can't neglect that. It doesn't seem quite right because there's going to be such small force. However, the, the thickness is also small, right? So when I subject this, I have pressure. I'm subjecting it to this pressure. Its, um, its response here can be significant with, that, with very little force because it's, it's, it's so small. Right? It's got such a small cross-sectional area. So it's... Um, <coughs> the stiffness there is going to be much reduced because it's got such a small, small area. So, so I'm now back to thinking that this, what I said in the notes previously, was indeed right. That uh, you know we can't neglect that. Even I think you might could neglect it. So we're going to we're just going to imagine that it's shielded. Okay. Um, okay. Now let me remind you that there's a problem. This is problematic. The analysis that we did in chapter five. And we're just going to take it, carry it through here as an, as an example. But it's, it has this, I don't even know to call it, it it's, it's really incorrect. Because you remember, it's assumed in the textbook that there's, um, it's unilateral, unidirectional compression and expansion. There's no bulging, right? And that's only going to occur when, for, for stress-free, this is essentially stress-free here. It is stress-free. Um, it's only going to occur when the wavelength is small and small compared to the transverse dimensions here. So we just violated our assumption of long wavelengths, right? <laughs> so, uh, but again, we'll just not worry about that, just carry through with the analysis. <coughs> uh, the equivalent circuit, if you look, go back and look at that, and um, <coughs> we consider the um, the equivalent circuit for open circuit operation, so we set i is equal to zero here, um, and we're going to, we want to go to the flat region, the low frequency region, so the inductance is going to become, at low frequency, neglect, uh, inductance becomes negligible. Here's what the, the circuit reduces to, the equivalent circuit reduces to in this case. <coughs> um, <coughs> and here are the expressions, I didn't put them in here, as Brian always does, but here are the expressions for the blocked capacitance, the motional capacitance, and the turns ratio. And why is this weird H here that we don't see very often? Why is that here? Because we're dealing with unilateral. Remember these different coefficients? This is not the typical Young, where the Young's modulus is at play. This is this uni, unilateral 
or unidirectional compressions and expansions. So we, you switch independent variables and you end up dealing in the transduction coefficients in the, the um, equations of transduction. We call the coefficients different symbols. That's why you see that H there. And there's the mechanical um, compliance, the motional capacitance, okay. The, or the motional compliance, capacitance, whatever you want to call it. Um, okay. So you remember the last thing we did in that chapter, we started from the general equations here for this, with the standing wave in there and specialized them and finally got the sensitivity. And then I mentioned to you that it's, since we're only interested in the low frequency limit, you should do that in the beginning rather than carry through with the exact analysis and you know, eventually make the approximation. And we actually did that in a homework problem. Well, we're going to do it. Um, we've already done it here. See, we've already made the low frequency approximation here. So I just want to remind, this is very simple, but you need to be able to do this quickly and accurately. What's the sensitivity here? Well, it's going to be, you know, the, the volts here divided by the, the pressure. We're going to do this in terms of pressure. And the pressure, of course, is the force divided by the area. So I think I listed it in here. This is really not going to be important, but technically there is a minus sign by the choice of positive direction, as we talked about before. F is positive for positive strain. And so the pressure is going the other way. So that's why I put the minus sign there. Remember that? Okay, so how do we get the ratio, the sensitivity? Well, we write down what we know. We look at Kirchhoff's laws. First of all, for the, for the left loop, very simple, right? Because there's no current here. I look at this loop. The voltage increase here has to be, the potential increase here has to be equal to the potential drop here. And that potential drop is just the impedance of a capacitor times the uh, times this current here because all this current goes this way so what I get for the left hand loop is this okay the voltage is the impedance times the current and for the right hand loop that turns out to be really simple here because I don't care this is, has no influence here but all the current goes this way so the voltage drops across here cancel so I set this voltage increase equal to this voltage drop and I get this relationship, okay, where we substituted in what F is, because we want pressures are ver the variable we're after here. And now you just um, take the ratio here. Just take this expression for the voltage divided by this for the pressure. The motional current will cancel out. And we have this. And this is precisely the answer we got back in chapter 5. You can check that. In that chapter, we also considered a um, in that chapter we also considered a length uh, uh, it was called the length expander bar there. So we can operate that as a hydrophone. Again, we want to um, imagine shielding the sides here, just exposing it here to the sound, just as before. And now the equivalent circuit um, it doesn't have that negative capacitance. And I need to tell you something, this is the by far the more standard case. This thickness vibrator is, is an exception. Apart from being really incorrect, you know, we're not we're not really correctly dealing with it because it's assuming the unidirectional motion. Uh, this is much more standard. It doesn't have that negative blocked capacitance here. So how do you get the sensitivity here? It's, it's again, it's pretty straightforward. We look at the left-hand loop. We write this just like before. Okay, look at Kirchhoff's rule here. Here we don't get the cancellation, so we get two capacitances we have to deal with. But again, the potential difference here is equal to the sum of the drops and the drops are just the impedances times the current so here the current here are the two impedances and all the current goes this way 
So we get that. And then we can uh, solve for the ratio of the voltage to the pressure. And then the standard kind of form, you'll see that it's frequency independent. Frequency dependence cancels out. And as I mentioned to you before, this is a nice way to represent the result. It's uh, in terms of the equivalent electrical capacitance of the, of the compliance of the, of the transducing material. It's just nice because it has the same dimensions as the block, electrical dimensions as the blocked capacitance. So that's why people often do this. Okay, now it's actually, it's convenient, especially since there's a weekend coming up. It's best for us uh, not to start this, just end early today. We'll start this on Monday. Um, let's see. So, I heard earlier that apparently the analysis for the efficient, the two different, finding the efficiency two different ways for the projector in experiment three is working okay. You guys understand what's going on there? And it, it, it's, and, you know, as always, if, 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 so I wrote, I gave you that, I guess I wrote it up on a sheet, right? If there's, if you see confusing things there, let me know, because that's going to be going into the revised laboratory handout. That's, I think that's the best way to do this, best way to, to, to handle this. And I should have done it long ago. Somebody should have done it before me, but uh, I shouldn't complain. But I should have done this. Um, but at least we're getting it done now, right? <laughs> that's good. Okay, does anybody else have any uh, comments or questions? Incidentally, so you have, you have quiz six. There's only one more quiz. There's only seven quizzes. There'll be a hydrophone quiz. So you'll get that when we finish it next week, and then we'll have those two remaining lectures and no quizzes on that. And so, all right, okay. You guys probably appreciate that since you're taking two acoustics courses this course.